All right, and we are back with the second half and we are also live on Facebook. Hey, everybody out there. Hey, Attorney April Prayer, how you doing today? Hello, Miss Xavier, how are you? I am great, I am great. It's so good to have the new shows. I love doing the replays for people who missed the, the live shows, but I really love the live new show. So welcome back, it's July. How's your summer going so far? Oh, wow. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what you said. It's July. How did we get to July 1st so fast? I could have sworn it was just May. I know. <laughs> this year, is, you know, there's only five months left in the year. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't yeah, say that. you know, I'm doing an event here in Milwaukee and it's December 6th. And I was just like, OK, we got five months. I'm like, good Lord, we only got five months. That's why my birthday is so important to me. I was just telling Khalid this. My birthday is August 23rd, so it's bittersweet because I know it's going to be wonderful weather and stuff, but I know it's almost over. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. But, you know, so this year has brought some really interesting stuff, which you are going to speak on today. The Roe versus Wade being overturned, which is astonishing. I can't believe that it happened, but I'm going to let you introduce your guest and Go ahead and take it over. I'm going to listen. Yeah. So for all the new listeners, my name is April Prayer. I am a criminal defense attorney in Chicago. I've been practicing for 22 years. I'm also a grassroots street law educator. I have a street law curriculum. I have a board game that teaches teens how to stay out of the criminal justice system. And so I always like to introduce myself at the beginning of each show in case we have new listeners. So all my topics are always law related in some way, but normally they're along the lines of criminal defense. But today we are veering away from that because like Xavier said, we've had something really remarkable happen in the last, I don't know, week and a half, I think it was last Thursday, that the Supreme Court came down with a ruling that was not a surprise because it had been leaked weeks before, but it was still very jarring. and. I've been learning so much over the last couple of weeks, or I should say week and a half, from other people on social media. And one of my guests, I'm going to tell you about how on her page every day it blows my mind, I learn something new. But I think it's not as simple as people just saying, oh, no more killing bait. That's what I see a lot. And that's in air quotes for those who aren't watching on Facebook or Zoom. Um, no more killing babies. I think it's so much more than that and i think that whether you are a single childbearing woman whether you are a married childbearing woman if you are a great grandma who can no longer have kids it's still going to impact you because it goes so much further than the technical surgical procedure of abortion because in the opinion which is dobbs v jackson a lot of people don't even know they're just like roe v way has been overturned and they don't even know the name of the case so the name of the actual case is dobbs v Jackson, and I've been explaining a lot that the Supreme Court doesn't go back 60, 70 years and took, take out an old case and say, we're going to throw this case out. It doesn't work like that. They look at a new case with new facts that touch on that old case, and then they're able to review it. And that's what happened here. So like I said, there are going to be lasting repercussions. And this is a good intro for my guest, my first guest. So her name is Michelle Hughes, and she too is an attorney, but her specialty is family building. And so that's anything from adoption, foster care, also IVF and the surrogacy contracts. She's involved in all of that and she's a master at it. And so when I say I've been learning from her over the last, I mean, I've known her about a year and a half, all through Facebook, but on her page, I've got to say she's the master researcher, which is no surprise. She graduated from the University of Chicago. So she's, a, she's whip smart. She's been practicing for 33 years, but she's really good at bringing up articles and, and journals and all kinds of facts that I would have never thought about. Like I said, so most people aren't thinking about adoption. They aren't thinking about surrogacy when they're thinking about the Roe v. I'm putting in quotes again, Roe v. Wade reversal, they're only thinking about, okay, few, no women in these red states will be allowed to get the clinical surgical procedure of abortion. And it's so much broader than that. And so I wanted to bring her in because she just has 
just this really depth of knowledge on all issues regarding planning uh, for a family and building a family. And she has her own law firm. And I wanna bring her in and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and cue Michelle. You can unmute yourself and welcome to the show, Michelle. I'm introducing you to Xavier as well. Thank you. Welcome for, for you know, allowing me to be here and to have a great conversation, hopefully on all the nuances and what I like to call the unintended consequences that people have not even begun to think about. But thank you for coming to the show. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. Okay. So, Michelle, like I said, so I've been watching your Facebook page, and I swear, literally, I've learned something new. So the number, the first thing I learned was, let's go back so my belief my belief is that this ruling by the court is part of a large master plan and it all comes from birth dirt that's the term of there being fewer white babies being born in the united states and because of that there's a scramble for white babies to be adopted there's a there's really there's really a push from conservative white Protestant Republicans basically force white women, whether they want the child or not, to give birth. And I really believe that women of color are just getting caught, caught in the crosshairs because they can really care less if we have more babies or not. And as a result of that, they think that forcing white women to have more babies is just going to increase the number of babies in adoption, and then people can just swoop in and adopt white babies. You have a different take on that. And what I take it from your page is that the, the current adoption system can't handle the babies in it, let alone the influx of more. So what do you have to say about that? Okay, so first of all, I want to distinguish between the babies or the newborns with domestic infant adoption from child welfare with kids coming in through foster care. So when you really look at the number of women who are placing kids you know, from birth as newborns, the estimates are like 15,000, maybe 18,000. With this decision, I would be shocked if you get even another 15,000 babies available for adoption. Because the reality is when women actually um, carry a child to term, um, they parent. That's what happens. The majority of women, despite poverty, despite domestic violence, despite whatever the challenges they may have in their life, they parent. So this flood of newborn babies, I don't think it's gonna be there. I mean, definitely there will be more newborn babies. Um, and I think that it will impact domestic infant adoption. But everything I've read says there's about 100,000 families each year waiting for a newborn baby. So even if we double from 15,000 to 30,000, you're still going to have a lot of families waiting for a newborn baby and all these people who are sitting there like biting just waiting I'll take your baby I don't think that's going to happen plus I think people fail to understand all the hoops that potential adoptive parents have to jump through with a home study criminal investigation background check for health care and other things in order to adopt a newborn that being said then there's the child care or the child welfare system. So what I think you will have happen is that, um, and we won't see this for two, three years probably, but what you'll have happen is these women who really didn't want to parent will be forced into parenting. And then a lot of these women who are making these decisions or had been making these decisions for an abortion, they were at their breaking point like they already most of them are moms and they knew that they could not handle another one or another two now why many of them probably the majority of them will be able to handle the additional child there will be a bunch who can't and that's where you're going to get the neglect the abuse the abandonment that's where you're going to get in about two to three years these women who got forced into it and then they couldn't handle that extra child and that child is then you know the mandatory reporter is going to have to be the one that calls and says this kid came to school and said they're not eating or it's going to be that vindictive neighbor who says you know 
I don't know where she is, but she left her kids alone because maybe she went to the store to get a loaf of bread for her kids. So you're going to see these kids come into the system. Um, and when that kid comes into the system, that, you know, toddler baby comes into the system, they're going to come in with the siblings above them. So what you're going to see is this child welfare system have all these additional children come in and we can't handle it now. There are states right now that are putting kids in the offices because they don't have enough foster families to handle these kids. There are, I think it was out in Washington where they had like teens living in a hotel because they didn't have foster families. Our systems, I mean, each state creates their own system, but generally speaking, all of them are to a certain degree broken and we don't have enough foster parents. Um, so that's the worry. Wow, and so you, you reminded me, I didn't say that you're also a guardian ad litem appointed by the courts in adoption cases. So based on, tell us a little bit about more about that role. So um, in Illinois, which is where I am, they, or at least in Cook County, they split the juvenile court case from the adoption case. So I am not over in juvenile court, thank God, um, where they deal with the situations of terminating the biological parents' rights. I get it on the back end, um, as I like to say. And so what happens is when adoptive parents adopt, there is always a guardian ad litem appointed in the adoption court and we review everything that is put before us in order to determine if we should recommend it to the court or not that this adoption goes through and so that's what we do um i'm in cook county and cook county being a guardian ad litem for the most part is reviewing all the paperwork all the reports all the um, pleadings at court in some of the collar counties, um, you actually go out and visit the child. I only go out and visit the child if there's some type of contested matter or some type of matter that needs um, me to talk to the child, and that usually is with teenagers. I made an appointment yesterday, actually, though. So I do do it, um, but I, you know, there's no real reason to talk to babies. <laughs> that doesn't help me but good point <laughs> but teenagers or older kids that aren't quite teenagers like tweens they may have a serious opinion about whether they want to be adopted or not under what circumstances um and so sometimes i have to go talk to them and deal with that okay now you sent me a number of articles right before we did the show to give me i told you she's a master researcher so she sent me different statistics so we started off the top of the hour talking about this birth dirt for white babies how do you see this affecting black women and black children as a result of the change in um well i i, I let me reword that because people keep saying change in the law there's no change in the law let me mm. let me strike that <laughs> Let me clean that up, attorney. Such a lawyer. <laughs> so, that uh, is started, lawyer language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We started at the top of the hour talking about the birth dearth and that my belief is that white Republicans want more white babies. And we talked about the effect on those white babies possibly coming into the adoptive system or into the, the, um, the, the foster care system. You sent me statistics telling me that black women who are turned away or refused an abortion are four times more likely to land in poverty six months after being refused that abortion. So how do you think that factors into what you said, that most people do end up parenting? How does that look for Black women and women of color? I think it looks like it looks now, it's just going to be worse, um, where black women fall into poverty and with poverty comes all sorts of challenges that they did not expect, or maybe they did expect them, but it comes with all sorts of challenges and too many kids then end up in the child welfare system. If you look at the numbers right now, pre-dobs, we are statistically more likely to end up into the child welfare system. And I think there's a direct correlation with poverty, right? Um, and our kids stay in the child welfare system about twice as long, right? We're less likely to have our kids adopted. We're less likely to have our kids returned, and they're in the foster care system. 
there are some amazing foster parents out there but there are also some really horrible foster parents out there too plus even if you have amazing foster parents that's trauma of the child being removed from the home unless the home is really detrimental um, that's trauma of the child being removed from the home and in some cases these kids get moved around from foster care to foster care placement if it's a group of siblings they get split up so now they're not with their siblings so it's sort of like this ripple effect um, you know what they say if they get a cold we get pneumonia so it's going to be this ripple effect where more kids are going to go into the child welfare system and when you add bias let's face it there's a whole lot of bias i posted an article this morning on how researchers deal with black families and bias and and one of the perceptions of some researchers is that we are basically defective um so therefore it's our fault so consequently you know when the child welfare professionals come out to talk to the parent they're not hearing um, what might be going on and what supports that they may be able to put into place and therefore it is more likely that the child will be removed from the home and don't get me wrong there are some kids who need to be removed from their biological parents they they can't parent right or they won't parent one or the other but far too many um, kids are removed especially black kids multiracial kids and Native American kids who with support systems would not have to be removed from the home and you know one of the problems is there's not enough money you know we as a as a uh, United States have no um, will to actually spend the money to help these families with enough safety nets and ironically the states that are most likely to have all these trigger laws to prevent abortion after Dobbs are the same states that have the least amount of safety nets, that have the least amount of um, food stamps, the least amount of, you know, they have the additional rules at schools to feed the kids at school, the least likely to give some public aid for housing. It's actually counterintuitive, but those, you know, if you look at the stats, it's quite disturbing so i will say this that my guest today all three of us have the privilege of being in illinois a blue state and will not be directly affected by these trigger laws but i believe that there will definitely be a ripple effect into our state and dawn can talk about this when i get to her on, on our not necessarily access to birth control, but the cost of birth control, I think is gonna skyrocket, skyrocket all over the United States. I think that IVF is going to be far more expensive all over the United States. And in some states it will be criminalized. So this is where I put on my, my criminal law hat. Um, another unintended consequence of this is currently, and I was surprised to see this the other day, I don't know if I saw this on your page or somewhere else, the number one cause of death of pregnant women is not any type of complication with their pregnancy. It is partner violence. It is they're getting killed by the man who knocked them up. So that's currently, that's pre docs That's pre-last Thursday. So if that's currently the number one reason is that these men are becoming enraged, maybe because she wants to keep the baby, she won't, whatever reason, I don't think that that's going to improve if there are more women who are being refused abortion or live in states where they can't get abortions or live in states which we may not even have access to birth control because Clarence Thomas has already warned us that that's next on his hit list. So again, I, this has far, I, I told people on my page, it doesn't matter if you are honestly pro-life or pro-choice, brace yourself because this is the beginning of the great rollback. And so, Michelle, my question to you is what other, whether it's in your wheelhouse or not, what other unintended consequences do you see coming down the pipe that maybe others may not be aware of? Okay, so, you know, when we talk about this, we're usually talking about terminating a pregnancy, but with uh, couples who have infertility, they are trying to build their family. So one of the unintended consequences is that a lot of these laws in the state, they, they say that embryos are unborn persons. 
which means that when you create embryos, you are creating an unborn person. That does not jive with how this works with IVF because the goal with IVF is to create the most embryos that you can create so that you have the most success with the possibility of having a child. And I just read something that like 50% of those embryos have some type of chromosomal defect. So if they are persons and they are, you know, you got to do something with them. Um, we right now have, I think, millions of embryos on ice throughout the country. I have no idea what the plan is going to be for all those clinics that are in those states like Louisiana that now considers that to be an unborn person. And you have these people who have created embryos two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they haven't been able to decide to, what they want to do with their embryos, but they've been paying for storage, but they may have 20, 30 embryos that are sitting there on ice. And for the people who are t about to start IVF, it's just way too expensive. It's expensive in the first place, but it's way too expensive to create it one embryo each time. Yep. So all these people who uh, want to become parents and two out of a hundred kids in the United States are born through IVF. So all these people who want to become you say one and two, two out two of a hundred. So 2%, oh. <laughs> no, no, 2%. What? Okay. But that's a lot. I mean, when you think about how many babies are born each year, how are those people going to be able to actually do IVF if you can only create one embryo at a time, right? It's just, it's, it's uh, prohibitively expensive. And so at the same time, we are stopping families from building um having more kids another thing that i'm seeing is that i am getting the calls from specifically the female same-sex couples um because obviously you know justice thomas has indicated that he wants to destroy their ability to be married if he destroys their ability to be married then the um the presumption the marital presumption that the other spouse is the parent goes out the door and so um, what I'm, I'm getting phone calls because people want to protect their parental rights within those marriages. And a lot of lesbians are parents with kids. Um, so there's this whole community, um, which I would argue the Supreme Court would like to get rid of. Uh, but there's this whole community that is worried about their parental rights with regards to this decision. Another unintended consequence. Um, I also think that you're going to have, you know, this may not be my place to speak, but OBGYNs, from what I understand, a lot of gynecologists are refusing to now practice um, obstetrics. Obstruct, I can't even get the word out, right? Um, because it's so expensive with malpractice insurance. So what does this mean now? I mean, already you're starting to see stuff in certain states where health of the mother, and I put that in quotes, air quotes, because they can't define health of the mother. You have doctors, instead of using their medical, you know, training, their medical expertise, going to lawyers to make decisions to satisfy the politicians uh, about women's health. Women are going to die. That's that's, you know, bottom line, women are going to die. Women are going to die because of the health issues. Women are going to die because of domestic violence. And I will tell you in the adoption arena, people do not understand how many women decide to place a child for adoption so they are not permanently linked to that man who is beating the crap out of them. So domestic violence is a huge thing. Women are going to die, I think, also with regards to... Um, you know, some of these crazy laws with bounty hunters where people can actually chase you down because they think you had an abortion when in reality you had a miscarriage. And miscarriages are really common. But I believe it's this law in Oklahoma now. I was talking to another uh, adoption attorney. And in Oklahoma, if someone thinks you had an abortion, 
even if it was a miscarriage, they can report you for a bounty. You have to prove that that was not the case. And guess what? You don't get to get any money back. So if I am a vindictive ex-husband, a vindictive mother-in-law, I'm a no nosy neighbor who just thinks I know too much, right? I report you for this uh, for this miscarriage. Now I I have to hire the other person has to hire a lawyer to get themselves off, and as we all know, we're expensive. Uh, and so realistically, that means that poor women will end up in jail. In fact, there's a case just out of Texas recently where um, with that new law where the woman was imprisoned because even though she had a miscarriage, somebody thought it was an abortion. Black woman. Oddly, that was the very first consequence I thought of. Oddly enough, that was the very first consequence I thought of when I heard about the Dobbs decision is that women who have a natural miscarriage will suddenly, it will be the, the Salem witch trials all over again. They will be accused of having induced it in some way, and they will be locked up, and they will let the judge sort out whether she did or she didn't. And, and how long like, does that take? Yeah, exactly. How long does that take when we're already backlogged two years from COVID anyway? But I'm gonna and where are her kids going during that time? There you go, into right? the foster care system. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. So I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to bring in our, our second guest, Hopped On.